Hi, I'm Gary Curran from biohackerslab.com, and today I have an interview with three people who are down at the low-carb, high-fat convention in Cape Town, also known as the Old Mutual Health Convention of 2015. Uh, my speakers are Dr. Asim Maholtra, Christine Cronau, and Karen Thompson, and I'm so gracious for them to have spent some time just to have a little chat with me about what's actually been happening at the conference for those of us who can't attend some of the highlights that have come out at the conference and some exciting future events that are to come. I really hope you enjoyed today's talk. And today I'm going to be doing an interview with the guys at the Low Carb High Fat Convention down in Cape Town, the old mutual health convention. Um, I'd like to introduce the speakers today. Uh, if you wouldn't mind just introducing yourselves. Hi, I'm Christine. <laughs> Christine Cronin. I'm a nutritionist from Australia, and I talk about the fat revolution. So, how we got fat completely wrong, and why the vilification of fat was the biggest health mistake in history. And this is the scene. Hi, I'm Seymour Hotra. I'm a London-based cardiologist, uh, and I'm here to talk about um, action on sugar, but also about um, evidence behind dietary changes that can reduce the risk of heart attack stroke. And I'm Karen Thompson. I'm the organizer of the Low Carb Health Convention or the Old Mutual Health Convention, as it's now known. Ah, brilliant. Well, thank you for taking the time to speak with me today. Um, yeah, so Karen, I just wanted to find out um, how did the convention come about? If you could just give us a bit of history about uh, how you got to this point today. Uh, sure. So uh, I've witnessed Professor Noakes getting a severe backlash from our local medical industry. Um, and people really weren't taking the time to investigate the science behind the diet, but they were very quick to criticize him. So I decided to invite some of the world experts in low carb to come and present their findings in Cape Town. So we started with four people, and it has literally just expanded into an event that I could not have imagined. Um, and we're so, so blessed to have... 17 of the world experts from around the world here in South Africa at the moment presenting on the low-carb, high-fat way of life. Um, and specifically, I think my highlights are Dr. Asim El Hotra and Christine Pinar because we all have a very similar message. Um, so that's why we're sitting here talking to you. Yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, it's, it's really the A-list of speakers when you look at the lineup. It's uh it's phenomenal. I mean, uh, if any if anyone wants to learn about the about the low carb, high fat lifestyle, I mean, yeah, that's the best place to be right now. It's where you guys are. So, yeah, uh, yeah it's a it's a pity I can't be there. i um, joining you, but um, I'm sure there's loads of other people around the world who are feeling the same. So, uh, that's uh, that's why we're doing this today. Um, but I'd like to just find out also a little bit about how. Um, how you found some of the, the, the attendees, so the, the public and the medical practitioners who are attending, because you're doing CPD work um, for medical practitioners. So I'd, I'd be interested to know how you found um, other doctors, what they've, what they've thought of all the knowledge bombs that you're dropping on them. So the doctors are being incredibly um, supportive, and I think we've changed quite a lot of minds um, of the medical professionals who have been open-minded. The people who are giving us grief, especially, especially on Twitter, really are the uninformed people who just want to have an opinion in order to get more followers. Um, now, that is my opinion, but really, you know, the, the points that I've seen raised are completely and utterly irrelevant. Mm -hmm. So, um, I think if people sat back and let go of ego, they would see that the science behind this way of life is there, and it has been for a very long time, um, and this really is the way to go. Yeah, I think yeah. I have to just come in. I agree with Karen entirely. I think there are a lot of people that have kind of just snubbed the message thinking that it's harmful, high fat, low carb, and not actually being willing to open their minds to come and, and listen to the speakers. And even myself, I've learned so much from this conference uh, and gone in with an open mind from, from several different speakers. And I think if those people who are cynical about it, if they come along and they listen and then they want to argue and uh, argue the case, then that's absolutely fine. Let's have open debate. But I think it's... Um, you know, I think it's actually really quite obscene that people can um, can criticise a conference when they haven't even been to it. So is that what you're noticing that you're getting some criticism, but then the the people who are criticising aren't actually at the conference? Absolutely. I, as far as I mean, most of the feedback that I've um, been talking to people from various speakers that have been here, um, I've not heard anything negative so far. 
Now, you could argue, you know, we may be preaching to some of these people who are already converted, but mm. I, I'm sure there are lots of people there who sit in sort of on the fence in a gray area that have come here uh, and are willing to listen. And uh, so far, the feedback has been very good. People, are, I think, their eyes have been opened. Mm. And the argument has been that this is, we are all so pro-low carb. And the truth is that we wanted to create a platform for discussion, but nobody was willing to come to discuss it with us. I um, invited 15 medical professionals to come and bring their side of the debate, and most of them came back saying that they didn't really disagree with this way of life. There were just some points that they disagreed with. So I think it's a lot easier for people to sit behind social media and uh, make comments and actually to show up in person and stand up for what you believe in. Mm, yeah, I, I guess that's always been the problem with anything. I mean, um, it's just honest debate um, rather than hiding behind other personas or walls. Absolutely, and the people who do come who are slightly skeptical, you know, there's so much evidence presented that I really don't think you can remain skeptical after you actually sit through it with an open mind and listen to it. So. Mm. It's quite interesting when people are undecided or they're feeling slightly skeptical but they have an open enough mind to come and look, the evidence is there and it's very, very clear. You really can't dispute it once it's in front of you. Mm. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm always, I'm blown away just when I I look at all the research that gets shared, um, you know, because I, I follow you guys on Twitter and whenever you, you share articles and PubMed reference, it's just, like you said, the science is there. It's um, it's just now fine-tuning things and just getting a, a deeper understanding, I think, of the uh, the benefits from eating a low-carb, high-fat lifestyle. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, if, uh, if you wouldn't mind also just doing a little um, little bit of coverage, uh, news coverage for us of day one and day two so far. Um, so maybe just what, what, uh, what you've thought so far of the first two days, any highlights from the speakers. Um, even a little bit of gossip, what's happening in that expert area. I know there's always lots of networking and there's um, usually gadgets and cool stands that uh, only attendees get to see and us who can't be there don't get a taste of. So if there's any sort of highlights, um, yeah. Uh, I think for me, one of, the highlight, one of the highlights for me certainly was meeting Gary Taubes. And you know, he started off the conference, he was one of the first speakers on, on the first day. Uh, and one clear message that came out of his talk is carbohydrate drives insulin that drives fat accumulation, and you know, that's the mo that's a very powerful uh, message. And in fact, you know, I think everybody took that on board. And it was very compelling. It's evidence based. Um, he got a great reception. I think a lot of people um, were really, you know, it's great you know, on um, great Karen and Tim Lopes to, to manage to get him to come speak it because he's got a lot of you know, sort of credibility as well. So for me, the highlight of the first day was certainly Gary's house. Mm. Yeah, I mean Gary's. Uh, yeah, he's a, a massive uh, author and, and public speaker for for this lifestyle. Uh, I've I've read his book. Yeah. Um, of course, many of us, many of us who who have started this, you know, we read Gary's work many years ago. You know, back I remember reading his article in the New York Times back in two thousand and four, uh, and so he's you know one of the early pioneers of getting this message moving and of course there's many others as well like Dr. Westman and uh, people like that who have been doing low carb high fat research for so many years and it's just fascinating to actually hear what they have to say after all that research they've done over the years. Mm. Yeah, I, um, and I think all the speakers have been excellent. I mean, we've been getting that feedback that everybody really has been phenomenal. Um, and we've also covered quite a wide range of topics from mental illness to diabetes and cardiovascular disease. Um, so it's been very interesting and it hasn't been boring and not everybody preaches the same message. But we're all coming from the same uh, place of wanting to empower people's lives through the use of lifestyle and getting away from this over-medication uh, that, that these doctors do, which I think has seemed like summed up beautifully in his talk this morning. Mm. Thank you, Karen. Well, in fact, on that note, one of the one message that I got across actually was a quote that I wasn't aware of, and people often, often ask me as an interventional cardiologist, because you know, my, my job has been you know, treating people for heart attacks, putting stents in, for example. Um, there's a quote from uh, Karen's grandfather, late grandfather, Christian Barnard, and that was, you know, he said, I've saved 150 people's lives, but if I'd focus on prevention earlier, I could have saved 150 million. I think that's very powerful coming from someone so great as Christian Barnard to say that. Um, but it's absolutely true, and I think the whole 
area around healthcare at the moment, you know, we need to shift dramatically. It needs to be a huge cultural change that moves away from just treating illness with often medications that are of marginal benefit at best. And have, you know, there's been a huge issue around the data behind driving these guidelines and conflicts of interest, bias funding the research. We need to shift towards actually encouraging people to adopt healthy lifestyles it actually can have a very powerful effect and in many ways much more powerful than most drugs that we give patients. Mm. Yeah, I think um, it's always interesting, uh, a member of the public, if, if you had to say someone like yourself has seen um, as a cardiologist, you might tell someone to eat fat. Uh, I mean, just the, that thought in their heads, they've been programmed for so many years to think, no, but fat kills you. And so that, you know, the heart guy is going to tell you, you know, also don't eat fat because it's bad for your heart. And now the message is coming out that actually, it, you know, healthy fat is healthy for your heart. Well, absolutely right. And in fact, I actually proactively tell my all my patients, please avoid anything marketed as low fat because the likelihood is it's going to have an adverse effect on your health because it's full of refined sugars, etc. And in fact, they should. I tell them you should eat more fat in your diet and cut out the refined carbs. Because that's the science, you know. You can't ignore the science. We've got very good data from randomized control trials that a high-fat diet, predominantly of Mediterranean origin, certainly reduces cardiovascular events and death. Mm. And uh, the current dietary guidelines, in my view, are misguided, and they need to change dramatically and very soon. Yeah, and uh, I see the news how the um, that um, that body in the U.S. I think I just saw the news that came out that uh, that's starting to change. I believe. What's so that? The, the U.S. guidelines and the advisory oh, yeah. so body. That was means... last week. So they, they've changed the guidelines. So that's a very good point you raise, actually, Gary. Um, we've demonized dietary cholesterol for a long time. Even though dietary cholesterol has very negligible, negligible impact on your blood cholesterol. And so the foods are very nutritious. For example, eggs have also been demonized along with that. And the U.S. last week, they've, they've decided that they're going to change their guidelines and no longer demonize dietary cholesterol, which is fantastic. You know, so forget about the egg white omelets. You know, eat the yolk. <laughs> yeah, enjoy the whole egg. Absolutely. Yeah. The chicken made the whole egg for you, so enjoy the whole thing. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. Um, so yeah, uh, you, you were mentioning this in how you've had a highlight with um, the, the quote. Um, have there been any other um, maybe little sparks of inspiration for any anyone else during the conference so far? Any other? Um, remarks or well, one thing. One thing that uh, I find really interesting, which I didn't know much about, um, was about the benefits of butter. And uh, Christine uh, gave a great talk about the um, uh, vitamin K two. If I'm, if I'm not wrong, and I think she, you know, she'd be able to speak about that now. Uh, yeah. um, because certainly, in terms of the evidence, you know, butter has been unfairly demonised, and certainly, uh, at very worst, it's neutral. I don't think it has a, a negative effect on heart health, and um, that's not an excuse to gorge in it. But uh, there is some nutritional value, and I think that was something I learned mm. which was from Christine's talk. So I think Christine may be able to elaborate a bit more. Yeah, I could be accused of gorging on butter, I think. <laughs> 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 when people sit down with me to eat. Uh, but yes, it's grass-fed butter is full of vitamin K2, which is a, a, an essential nutrient that we've pretty much eliminated from our diet because the best sources are your grass-fed butter, pastured egg yolks, and also soft fatty cheeses like camembert, brie, gouda, etc. All those foods have been demonized. So we have very little vitamin K2 in the diet. Now not only is it essential for developing children, etc., etc., but it actually protects us from heart disease because if we are having some sort of build up in our arteries, calcification of the arteries from too much of a Western style diet or too many carbohydrates. Vitamin K2 actually comes in there and clears that calcification. It directs calcium where it needs to go in the body. And mm. so fatty foods, you know, we've been told to avoid them, but they actually do, these natural ones, protect us from heart disease. Yeah, and to add to that, actually, um, Christine made a very important point there. The, the cheeses, I mean, they've been unfairly demonized as well. And in fact, following there have been two recent big studies actually that suggest that saturated fatty acids, and there's another important message here, Gary, that all saturated fats are not the same. There are scores of different types of saturated fatty acids. And there was a very good study which was published in one of the Lancet journals um, last year, which actually looked at um, blood levels of saturated fat and their association with types of diabetes. And what they found was that if people had saturated fats from full fat dairies, particularly cheese and yogurt, 
that was associated with reducing the risk of type 2 diabetes. But what else is interesting from this is that many people don't realize saturated fatty acids in the blood are also endogenous, endogenous, endogenously <laughs> synthesized by the liver. And actually what drives that endogenous production of those saturated fatty acids that were associated with an increased risk of type 2 diabetes is starch, sugars, and alcohol. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, 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 it's just fascinating. Um, do you think that, that you know, so the, the low-carb, high-fat lifestyle, it, it is just about resetting your metabolism, and we're, we're mainly talking about hormones here. Um, is insulin the key focus, would you say, from a hormone, or are you, is anyone delving into some of the others, like uh, leptin or um, any other particular hormones that you think are getting influenced um, for lifestyle diseases here? Well, the thing is, once you go low like, carb, high fat, you regulate all that naturally. So when we're eating, the thing about carbohydrates is they're not innately bad for us. The problem is that we can only use or store a small amount at any one time. So if we have too many, and of course when we got rid of the fats, we had to replace it with something else, and, and that something else has been excess sugar and carbohydrates. Mm. So once, you know, when we're eating too many sugar and carbohydrates, we're producing too much insulin, etc., etc., but as soon as we cut that back, we go back to our normal diet that we evolved to eat, and we are eating a normal amount of carbohydrate again, all that regulates. The hormones regulate, everything else regulates. So uh, then you don't even have to think about all the different components because everything just comes back to baseline. And Gary, that's a really important point. You know, the, the emphasis should be on good nutrition, so foods that give you good nutritional value, not counting calories. And actually, I agree with Christine on that, that the... Ultimately, what will happen is the body will, will auto-regulate itself so that, you know, those cravings, those hunger cravings, the excessive eating, all that, that kind of stuff, that will, that will improve just by concentrating on foods that um, are going to give you value, value to your health. And, you know, there's one mantra which, uh, you know, I, I've cited quite a lot recently, uh, and that's one message that I think we need to keep getting across to people is that food can be the most powerful form of medicine or the slowest form of poison. And I think whenever I eat my food now, I've conditioned my mind to think in that way. And it's true, it's not it's not um, pseudoscience, it's good scientific evidence to support that. Yeah, well, I mean, that's what gets preached all the time, food is medicine. Um, and is, Hippocrates said that, didn't he, wasn't it? Isn't that one of his old sayings, let food be thy medicine? Or yeah. And um, yeah, I mean, so we've always known. And I, I guess but, doc my, but doctors don't. Unfortunately, doctors don't do that. You know, and that's one of the things I talked about in my talk today. I know I didn't have a single lecture in medical school on evidence-based nutrition, and doctors are a source of information for a lot of people. People trust their doctors. So for me, it's really important that we get this right and we start giving those messages to our patients. Often, what we do is we give them pills instead, uh, and that isn't right. Yeah, it's kind. Of, I guess it's a paradox where you think a doctor is questioning what you eat, saying that what you eat is affecting your health, but not able to then sort of fix that scenario. They can just deal more with the symptom, saying, okay, so I, th I think what you're eating is creating this disease or symptom, therefore here's your treatment, which is going to be this um, synthetic instead. That's exactly right. And then the other problem is once you get treated for one thing, you create side effects, then you've got to be treated for your side effects, and then you create more side effects. And you end up with this horrible scenario where you, you're just really ill from all the side effects from all your medication. And if you just take even one, you know, one example like um, type 2 diabetes, we can take a, a type 2 diabetic patient and treat them with low carb by fat and every time their sugar will drop, every single time. Mm. And they can get rid of all their symptoms. Uh, of type 2 diabetes and some people even have the diagnosis of type 2 diabetes removed from their chart because they simply have no symptoms anymore. Uh, so it's quite fascinating and there's so many diseases like that that can be treated completely with diet yet so many people don't know this and they go on medications thinking that that's going to regulate their blood sugar, regulate their heart tension and Instead, you know, they're eating all these foods that are causing them to get worse when they could actually heal it quite easily with a simple change in diet. Mm, habits, yeah, just get, uh, and like you said, looking at, looking at your plate that's in front of you and realizing, you know, there's three things on there. There's fat, protein, and carbohydrates. 
figuring out the ratios and, and saying, you know, when I eat this over the next one or two hours, I'm going to get this reaction, and what reaction do you want? So, like you were saying with the, with the diabetics, you know, um, it is sad to think that some of them have been fed certain foods, even though they've got insulin problems, and it's creating more insulin issues for them. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. I actually met a woman in Adelaide who was, uh, she had gestational diabetes when she was pregnant, and the doctor kept giving her the, you know, prescribed diet, you know, whole grains, low fat, <coughs> etc., etc., complex carbohydrates, and her blood sugars just kept climbing. And he eventually got to the point where he yelled at her because he was saying, you're, you've got to get your blood sugar down. It's so dangerously high. Now, a friend of hers, who was a follower of mine, said, why don't you just get rid of the bread for one day? See what happens. Her blood sugar started dropping immediately, so she stayed off the bread, and she never had a problem after that. Instantly fixed. Yet, on the conventional health that you know her doctor was prescribing her with the conventional guidelines, that was making her sick. So you should have been charging for the removal of the bread prescription per month. <laughs> um, Gary, we've got to finish up because we've got to get back. Sure, no problem. Um, but yeah, uh, yeah. I just wanted to find out also, um, my last question then uh, would be, so we we know that the, I think the video talks are going to be available after this conference um, for, pe for people to purchase. Um, and yeah, are there going to be any future uh, plans for any more conferences? We're hoping to bring it to the UK. Yeah, well I think, you know, this has been such an amazing event and we're not even, we're only halfway through and I'm sure it's going to get even better. Um, I think this is something that we should try and bring to the UK. I think there's going to be um, a huge interest in, in Britain. As you know, Gary, there's been a lot of, you know, Britain in some respects has been, you know, in terms of media interest has been huge on the sugar aspect. They've been, you know, publishing all the studies that are coming out suggesting that, you know, we've got it wrong with low fat. I think there'll be a lot of interest from a lot of people. Uh, Gary, I hope you agree that people would love to come and see this sort of conference take place in the UK and we get other speakers and get more people. Uh, and I think it could uh, really have an impact. Even you know, this is where it's begun, and then it will just move on from there. Yeah, I think that's fantastic. And then we also need to take it to the heart of the obesity epidemic, which is America. So we're hoping to do 2016 in Washington D.C. Oh wow! Yeah, so it's really yeah. I mean, this is going to go big. So we can. <laughs> yeah, fantastic. That's awesome news. Well, yeah, I'm going to publicize this as much as I can for you guys. So. I just want to say, um, yeah, thank you very much for taking the time for speaking to me today, and um, I wish you all the best. Thanks, Gary. Hey, That's great. Cheers. Bye. Right. Bye. Bye.